Thank you. Right, so yeah, we've got 45 minute session um, and ho hopefully talk for about 20 to 25 of them, should leave plenty of time um, open for questions. It is kind of the first time we've really talked a lot about this topic, so um, hopefully there is some good discussion there at, at the end. So, um, internationally competitive farm systems for the future, I guess what, let's start big picture and think about what sort of uh, global factors there might be out there that actually affect our farm systems. Um, we've heard, I think earlier this morning, um, uh, as I mentioned as well, you know, the reality is we, we export by far the majority of our milk and therefore we need, our, our milk products need to have more attractive attributes than, than those of our competitors. And actually uh, it is our farm systems that deliver these attributes by and large. So there was a question in that, that morning session about, oh isn't, it, isn't that Fonterra's game to um, be differentiating products and, and selling them? Well actually it is, uh, our farm systems have a big influence on, on what they could be doing with that, that milk. Um, so yeah, we need, we need farm systems that deliver attractive um, product attributes, but those systems also have to operate within our domestic constraints, which we've also heard about, things like water quality, greenhouse gases, um, and they also have to be resilient to um, that, that regional variation, but um, probably just as importantly, that year-to-year -year variation that um, you're not having to sort of lurch from one extreme to the next, um, depending on the climate. So just um, a, a sort of an intro slide about Frontier Farms and, and uh, the project and sort of the, the, the process that we go through towards developing those um, internationally competitive farm systems. So the first step of that is to identify where we think the frontier will be. You know, what, what is, um, where, do, where do we need to get to in terms of those product attributes? And use that as a prioritisation exercise to take through into um, a, a, a designing what those systems could look like, right? Because the future, you know, it's a pretty broad topic, right? And, and, and um, working out exactly what's going to be important within that um, so that we can focus our, our limited resources uh, is important. So using a, an exercise like uh, a competitor analysis to, to really prioritise what attributes we think are going to be important, go into a co-design exercise with um, farmers and, and rural professionals and scientists to work out what systems could deliver those attributes and then uh, actually test those out, right? So um, if we've done a good job of designing uh, uh, you know, systems that are uh, uh, for the future, when we go to test them now, inevitably they're probably not going to work how we expected to because they'll have been designed on paper and actually it's that testing, revi refining and evaluating that's, that's really critical and the learnings from that is what's going to be valuable to the industry. So just um, a little bit more about I guess what is a frontier farm to kind of try and calibrate your, your thinking about what I'm talking about here. The idea of a frontier farm is that it's, it's aspirational, it's inspirational, it really challenges our thinking of, of what is possible. You know, it is out there type stuff, right? It's beyond the current frontier. We're trying to get ahead, um, and so it's not, it's not, we're not talking about sort of integrating the best of the current knowledge from, from the various research projects into one place. It's actually creating new knowledge and new systems. And to do that, it's, it's yeah, novel systems or ones that perhaps uh, do exist already but they're kind of unproven, uh, whether that's full systems or actually just components of systems, uh, or it could be uh, using an existing technology um, and combining it, using it in a, in a different way that it wasn't originally intended. Um, and also it could, it could involve revisiting old ideas, you know, that there's, there's um, plenty of uh, creative solutions that people have come up with over the decades that for whatever reason they didn't work at that particular time you know, th that global operating context, the world that we have to farm in constantly is evolving and actually some of those old ideas that didn't take off at the time could be really highly applicable uh, in, t in today's world or there could have been some particular reason why it didn't work that a new technology has sort of overcome that one limitation that now unlocks that, the potential of that, uh, that system. It's not the intention that we're doing something readily adoptable. I'm not, um, you know, we, uh, when we do, you'll find out a bit more detail uh, through the presentation, but when I talk about these systems, it's not saying we think you're going to be doing this in two years' time type thing. This, this is getting ahead of the game so we can do that, um, that five years, that decade of learning how those systems work before they might be needed. 
And, and I guess another way of looking at there is, is taking that risk in a research context. So instead of the, the hundred most innovative farmers around the country, each trying things individually and, and, and you know, uh, some succeeding and others not, this is a, a kind of a way to do it, um, I guess, on, on steroids, bringing it all together in one place and taking that, that bigger risk um, and, and uh, in doing so, really testing and refining those systems. So if we think about that, that first step in the kind of process, identifying where the frontier is, um, it, it, the, another way of looking at that question is, I guess, where might we want to be in a decade, where might we need to be in a decade, or potentially even slightly further than a, than a decade ahead. Um, the primary focus for this project is around that global competitiveness. So we, we have, our systems have to tick those other boxes, but this one is about being internationally competitive primarily. Um, and to do that, as I said, we, we've uh, used, used competitor kind of analyses to start with anyway, um, to look at where we think uh, they might be, uh, and then therefore where we might need to be to be more competitive. So we've started off with two um, US mega dairies, which I'll talk mostly about today, because that's one we've sort of ticked off, uh, as well as um, milk alternatives, which we heard uh, a bit of discussion on that today, um, earlier on. I wasn't planning on talking a lot about that um, uh, in this presentation, but there is plenty of time for questions, and um, I think if we run, run flat on questions for, for this, what I do cover, then that would be an interesting topic to um, come back to, because I think uh, Melissa had some good points, but equally uh, I think there's uh, a, a different viewpoint in a, in, in a few different places. So, um, uh, and so yeah, look, look at... Um, those competitors under a range of future scenarios, right? Because it goes without saying we don't know what the future holds, we can kind of make predictions, um, but looking at, at those, where those competitors and ourselves could be under those divergent kind of futures by doing that um, and looking at what themes come through in common between them is, a, is a, I guess, a way of saying, well, this is the best bit of, of something that is going to be important to focus our efforts on. Um, so yeah, a bit more into the US mega dairies, uh, why them? Um, so previous work has suggested that um, actually they can achieve quite a high profit operating margin. So um, here's a sort of international comparison, not industry level, this is individual farms that sort of were part of a, a, um, an international benchmarking exercise. New Zealand, the, the country code on the bottom, the number represents the number of cows and then some of these ones have extra letters, it's like the state for, for the US. And so you can see New Zealand over here, uh, and this was uh, you know, a 2,600 cow farm in Idaho, showing that yep, th these systems can be highly profitable for them. Uh, and in particular, they have an ability to scale up. So, um, and and we, you already see that when, when the economic conditions uh, are favourable, they, they open the tap, basically. Um, and so that potentially that could, that could uh, increase. And I guess in doing so with that ability to scale up, actually they've got some, 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 uh, some clear advantages, I suppose, where as the farms get larger, their operating costs go down. Basically the same decision, you know, you build one 2,000 cow barn and you, you work out your, your, your sort of um, management decisions, which are a lot around nutrition for their system. Um, you, you get that system humming and it's ticking this box here and then to scale up, you're just building another barn and you're the, the, the number of decisions or the type of decisions you're making are identical. So it's just you can replicate it, which is where you get those economies of scale, which is different from a lot of our systems where actually once you get to that sort of three, 400 cow size, actually any economies of scale we get tend to be eroded by our management complexity of running larger and larger farms and, and the challenges that that introduces. So we think they are uh, a potential um, you know, a competitor in the future. And so the uh, future scenarios that we looked at uh, where, where they might be and where we might be in that 20, 30, 40 type horizon, uh, there was five of them. One was uh, essentially a business as usual type scenario where existing trends that, that uh, are, are, are happening at the moment just continue. Uh, one where uh, there's sort of an upregulation of um, consumer sort of um, pickiness in terms of the, 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 the types of products that they might be buying. Um, another one uh, around chaos and populism, which at the time we started doing this uh, two years ago now, 
Um, didn't seem that likely, but actually is probably the scenario that's playing out at the moment. That's that's the the, the you know the rise of nationalism, uh, wars, um, you know populism with with Trump and Putin, uh, high inflation, high interest rates, market disruption in terms of trade barriers and things like that. Um, so if that what that that future um, becomes more prevalent, another one around regulation rules, which has some similarities to consumer as king. You know, it's a um, that the attributes to our products are more important, but there is a quite a different distinction. If it's driven by consumers, kind of implies that they're prepared to pay more for it, whereas the regulation rules one is not necessarily the case, that you, it's kind of almost like a barrier to entry type thing. Uh, and then that fifth one was new agriculture revolution. So that's kind of the, that, um, you know, genetic uh, editing, that, that essentially we've got a whole different, we've overcome a lot of our current challenges and, and are focusing on the future. And I guess relative to US mega dairies, that's quite relevant because they have options to use those technologies that we don't at the moment. Let's have a quick drink. <coughs> So the, these were the kind of key areas and themes that came through from looking at those um, different scenarios. So the, the future won't be any one of those scenarios individually. It will be made up as a composite of them. Um, but looking across them, these were the key areas that kind of came through, which actually, you know, it's quite a similar list to the one that Bridget put up um, earlier on in terms of those, those focus areas. One around footprint. You know, that's, that's the, the uh, carbon footprint as well as water quality. One around animal welfare, um, uh, around people, cost of production and uh, transparency, which I'll talk a little bit, I'll elaborate a little bit about what that, that is. Uh, when we looked at those kind of five things, there's actually a lot of investment going into um, the envir environmental footprint at the moment. We've heard about some of those projects down there and we kind of looked at and thought, hey, whatever system we design in this project, actually we can kind of incorporate that, that knowledge quite quickly in it. Um, animal welfare is likely to be a key focus for the next, kind of when we look through those milk alternatives. Um, so we sort of thought we might park that one now and, and basically chose to look at these bottom three focus our efforts there um, because there's some pretty strong interactions between those three, right? You can run a, a system that's sort of great for people, um, but that's costs a lot to run, or equally you could run a very low cost system that's basically a, a not attractive for, for, for people to be working in, right? So you kind of have to, both of them require sort of farm scale demonstrations to look at what's happening, you can't focus on, on um, component work. Uh, and then the transparency one, um, you know, said so I'll talk a little bit more about that, hopefully it becomes clearer. Um, so yeah, we chose, let's try and push that frontier on labour, cost and transparency, and for those other two, just maintain at, at, at sort of leading practice. In terms of those three, you know, on the, from the labour perspective, um, productivity in our industry has plateaued at about 150 cows per, per FTE. It's, it's been stagnant for a few years now. <coughs> uh, we have a declining availability of rural labour. That's probably only going to continue. Um, and, and you know, immigration and things like that is not necessarily going to solve uh, that problem. And I mean, it is a challenge now. It's not even a future a future challenge, right? So I think we can all agree that that's an important thing uh, to be focusing on. From the cost side of things, while knowing it's really important, um, actually it's a bit tricky when you talk about the future because if we're designing a system now for a decade in the future, we don't know what what those future costs are going to look like necessarily, especially when it comes to new technologies that, you know, typically when technology is introduced, they cost more than they do in, in the future. Um, so st for some of these things, like the new technology, we may have to work backwards and kind of work out, well, actually, when we, when we tested this in the system, we think it had this much value. Therefore, in 10 years' time, it would need to cost this in order for it to kind of make sense in, in the system. Um, but equally, when you look at uh, the sort of the long-term milk price, which actually is reasonably... Uh, constant when you adjust for inflation things like that. To get a 30% margin is kind of like a, a healthy amount for a sustainable business. A 10% reduction on our current operating expenses would be quite a good, uh, a good place to start um, in terms of the future system. 
in terms of transparency or provenance kind of is another word that, that I use there, essentially this is about meeting our, our customer and, and regulatory expectations or it's, it's not even necessarily about meeting them but it's about demonstrating them. So we've heard uh, in some of those presentations this morning, you know, we do have a good story about our product um, but actually having the data that backs up that, hey, it's great that our cows are out grazing, it's actually quite hard. We don't have a lot of hard data relative to, say, US mega dairies <coughs> where they can kind of control the environment, you can monitor the heck out of it, and you can be very prescriptive about this is the standards within the system. Um, and we thought that one was also complementary with, with some of our other goals in terms of automation, so um, data is obviously going to be a key part to that. Um, so automation to provide data as well as simplifying our system, so fewer things that you might need to be monitoring. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so next step, uh, we, we sort of that was the, the, the frame up piece about the, that prioritisation exercise, what attributes might be important. We then held a co-design workshop with farmers and RPs, I can see one of them in the room, um, where we presented this this mega dairies analysis and, and kind of talk them through it and um, the participants in that group kind of identified that um, the peaks in labour demand were a key limitation to improving uh, efficiency within that our current systems, right? Um, and ultimately set a goal of designing a system A to flatten the peaks in labour demand within a day so our, our milking ties up a lot of labour, right? And it's at two very set times in the day and you kind of need all your, your labour tied up there. Um, it doesn't give you the sort of flexibility to be doing other tasks at other times and, and making that attractive workplace. Uh, and then throughout the year as well. So we have calving and mating as <coughs> um, a busy time on farm, right? You, you kind of need um, potentially twice as much labour at that time as you do in, in other periods of the year. And then also in, in, in flattening that peak, those peaks, also looking to reduce our overall um, labour requirements. Going through a design exercise within, in that same workshop, um, there's, there's a whole lot of good ideas that came through in there. Two of the kind of flagship ideas that, that we've uh, settled on to kind of progress at this point was uh, batch robotic milking to flatten those labour requirements over the day. So um, taking the labour out of milking means you can do tasks throughout that day um, whenever suits, essentially, and can be doing other things that might be off-farm within that, <coughs> as well as extended lactation to reduce p um, peak workload around that calving and mating. So if we look at this table, and there's a lot of info on it, but essentially trying to um, separate out why those two were, were particularly um, uh, important to solving those challenges. If you look at reduce the goal of reducing labour requirements and the, group reduce, uh, the goal of flattening those peaks in workload, you know, you've got things like virtual herding and once a day flexible milking that, they do reduce the overall labour requirements, but they don't necessarily help with flattening that peak workload, right? Equally, you've got options like being split calving and stuff that might flatten the workload throughout the year, but it's not actually reducing your overall labour requirements, whereas uh, these two here in particular are, are complementary there for, for achieving that goal. <coughs> Elaborating on those two things a bit further, uh, so uh, robotic milking options, if we start with, with the batch robotic milking, traditionally, well the current sort of technology is around boxes, um, they are expensive to purchase um, and therefore you need to minimise the number of them uh, to make that system work and in doing so you end up with voluntary milking typically, right? so you're distributing those milkings over 24 hours to really maximise that utilisation, minimise the number, um, but it's, an, it's, an, you know, it's been uh, 20 years since um, Dexcel uh, looked at robotic milking options, um, it's a system that we know can work but adoption is low, and I think a large part of that is due to the complexity of running uh, that kind of voluntary milking type system. We are starting to see now new, new approaches coming onto the market, so multi-arm type systems, so there's an example of one there. Um, the speed limitations of the robotic technology does mean that we need a robotic arm at each milking point, so it's not the idea of you know a conventional rotary and putting a robot and a cups on that that technology is, is cannot work fast enough at least in in the horizon that we're talking about 
here. Um, and so if we need a milking, uh, a, a milking, a robot at each milking point, um, it's cost, for, cost prohibitive to replace conventional milking systems, right? 50 bale rotary, that means you need 50 robotic arms. The cost just goes through the roof. So um, <clears throat> we need to rethink the system. Instead of trying to make the technology do what we want it to do, let's look at what, te what the, te the existing technology and how it performs and design the system around it. So um, thinking about how we might rethink it, so the main constraint to milking as a batch, as a herd, um, is the time out of the paddock, right? You can't have the herd, the cows standing in, in your milking um, collection yard for, for five hours, for example. Um, so in our workings, we assumed that the maximum time they could be out of the paddock was two hours, or sorry, maximum time they could be in the dairy was two hours. <clears throat> So in order to do that, we could uh, one option is to divide the herd into batches. And so combining that with other technologies, for example, virtual herding, so um, not increasing the labour requirements of running separate batches, but also um, without something like virtual herding, you still end up with those peaks in workload, right? You can automate milking, but if you have to manually bring the cows in, then actually you've still got that peak that's there. Um, and by doing, dividing that herd into smaller batches, um, you can significantly reduce the number of clusters you need to, um, to automatically milk the herd and therefore have significant cost savings and get milking done in that sort of nine to ten hour window that, um, remembering, milking might be automated but you're still going to need, someone still needs to be on call because there will be things that go wrong and that's again one of those issues with the 24 hour distributed milking is that it's not that attractive to be on call at midnight type, type thing. So um, just Elaborating on that as an example, so if we think about a 300 cow herd, instead of milking that as one 300 cow herd, we're thinking, okay, let's milk this as three 100 cow batches. Um, and by doing that, we could build a, t a, a 10 um, uh, robotic milking, instead of we would have needed 30 if we wanted to milk that as one batch of 300. And um, we could milk between the hours of 7 and 5 p.m. So within that sort of attractive workday um, a limitation. So does that assume once a day? Or? Nope. No, so still, still twice a day. Um, so there's, there's an example there. So we're no, changing the milking intervals. So um, in this case, I think it's more like an 8 and 16 hour in interval, which is why milking two is much shorter because there is less milk to harvest. But um, no, still twice a day milking. Because remember the, the um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so that's the batch robotic milking. Extended lactation was that other component that we were looking at there. Uh, clearly it has advantages in terms of reducing the number of calvings and matings. Um, during that spring period, you know, it's a significant time associated with calving, the costs associated with, with doing that and getting cows back in calf, burnout through that period from fatigue, and then of course there's the, 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 uh, the number of calves that are born as well. Um, and so, um, it it's kind of is that rate limiting step like I mentioned before in terms of operating with fewer people, right? You potentially need twice as much labour as you at, during that period as you do for the rest of the year. Sorry. With that 24 month carving interval, did you look at having um, all year round carving as opposed to batch carving? Uh, not a lot. We certainly talked through all of the different scenarios, and, and that was obviously one of them. The, the more detailed model, that, that um, option didn't make it through to the more detailed modelling, but it certainly was considered. Um, ultimately, the, way, the, the key reason why we went with this one as being um, the option that we want to test out is because it is the closest match in feed demand to our 12, current 12-month 12 system. So you're looking at 18-month ones, it gets really complicated. You know, if you have your whole herd on 18 months, you're switching between spring, autumn, spring, autumn each year, which is quite a difficult thing to get your head around. Every year you're managing the farm a bit different. And if you split it so that half the herd's doing spring and half the herd's autumn, you still end up with every year being a bit different. Every third year you're dry over winter, whereas the other two you're, milk, you're still milking cows through the winter. So it's this system here, um, where 24 month calving until half calving each year, um, it, it is the one that best matches our feed, our feed supply curve essentially. And, and it minimises some risk, right? Imagine if you were, um, 
doing 24 month carving and just the whole herd carving in one year and then not in the next, you're obviously introducing quite a bit of risk through that time because if something happens we need to dry the cows off, you've got no cows carving down again. Uh, and then obviously thinking back to the goal around flattening the peaks and workload, doing that you've still got yourself a peak uh, in one year and, and then uh, nothing in the next year effectively. So. From a, you wouldn't have like that labour intensive period instead of having you know the big days for two weeks where you've got a large amount of calves to get in and train to feed. Instead, you would have a small amount of calves every day to feed. It introduces a lot of other challenges. So, from a people perspective, perhaps, but there's a lot of other system things that count against that. Um, that mean that w we believed anyway. The, the group that were involved in the designing, plus backed up by the modelling, that. This, this was our sort of leading candidate, I guess, in terms of a system to, to test. It's not to say, oh, well, jumping ahead a bit, but that's not to say this is the one system that we think people should be doing by any means. Um, but it, it's, yeah, the one that we want to kind of test out and, and um, see how it goes. So the modelling, which, which is quite, there's a, there's a lot of assumptions in, in here and there's not a lot of data to kind of back it up because no one's really doing this at the moment. People are doing 18 month ones and yes there's the odd cow that ends up doing two year lactations but at a system level there is really no data on how this might perform. Um, but some back of the envelope type modelling suggests that um, potentially for a, an upper North Island a winter dominant pasture growth area actually it could be a more profitable system and for uh, more like the South Island potentially there, there's some costs, it, it might be a less profitable system, although maybe not massively less profitable. Where, where does the profit come from, just because of extra milk? Um, a combination of, um, you, you're milking through a period that you wouldn't before, like winter, it is also offset again by um, uh, the cows in their second year of lactation are going to be producing less, but they're going to be older as well, so your average age goes up, which um, older cows produce more, or at least uh, middle-aged cows produce more. Um, and then there's obviously a lot of costs that you're not having to bear uh, in terms of calving and mating, etc. So, Is there a lot of reduced days? Could we, I think maybe we just park the question, so it's great, um, but just um, because the, it is being recorded, and it's great if we use the microphone to ask questions and that way it can come through on the camera. So yeah, was, there's a lot of assumptions that go into this um, and we, look, it's really, I think we'll all agree that a 24 month lactation, or sorry, 20 more, 24 month calving interval is really pushing the frontier with what we can do with our Kiwi genetics in a pasture based system, right? So if we look globally, Farmers do this already, right, with you know, your big North American Holsteins, lots of feed, etc. That aspect to that is not particularly novel, but doing that in our systems uh, is, is potentially going to be challenging. Um, so, what's next for 23, 24? Um, and so we, 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 we want to test that out. Uh, we've got a farmlet scale pilot of that system that we're setting up right now. Um, we're we want to test it out and particularly understand that feed flow management. So, you know, we've got two herds at very different stages of lactation, different feed requirements, how that aligns with the feed supply and demand. And obviously a big question mark there is how those cows perform in that, that second year. And of course, get a, get a feeling for profitability before we jump to that farm scale because it's, as I said, it's, a, it's an out there system um, and we don't want to turn it into a, a a system five type system, in order, like a North American style system to do that. We know we don't want to head down that route from that competitiveness point of view. Um, and so, yeah, let's test it out, see how we go. And then the other work that we're working on now uh, is starting discussions to try and set up a batch milking, um, robotic milking farm scale. Ideally in 24-25, it's 12 months away, it sounds like a long time, but actually the, to, to get this happening there's a lot of conversations and, and agreements that need to be put in place that may mean that actually stops back a year, but we want to set up a working demonstration of that, that system that we talked about. Uh, that then come about 26-27 we could actually, assuming the farming experiment is, is promising, introduce that component into 
that and, and ending up with that sort of frontier farm system with those two components up and running. And then the other key activity is co-designing another system in response to that milk alternatives analysis that, um, that we're working on at, at the moment. And that's the kind of thing that um, I think it was mentioned in one of the presentations earlier. You know, it could be something out there like, can we do cow-calf contact at scale? That, that kind of idea, really, again, pushing the frontier, taking the risk, seeing, challenging our thinking of, of what's possible. So, uh, just in summary, I guess I look at this as evolution, not revolution, but I can appreciate that does depend on your perspective. Some of those things might sound quite out there, but from, from my point of view, it's still pasture-based, it's not that different, you're still calving and milking cows, managing your pasture, etc. Um, the idea of this project over time is, is to test and refine those different systems, so it's not uh, to say that a system with batch robotic milking and extended lactation is the future system. It's, that's one system we want to test out. There'll be many components to it. You might just be interested in one of those two components. We're really here to try and provide options that, that, that could fit into those future systems. Um, there are lots of views about the future and priorities, and it'll certainly be interesting to see um, at question time your views, I guess, on that, because yeah, as I said, everyone's got quite different views and, and may, not, not everyone might agree with the direction we're heading in, but I think um, a key role of this project is, A, to challenge our thinking of what's possible, but in doing so, stimulate the discussion and have new ideas, because by putting up some ideas, I'm sure you're all thinking about now about, oh, that wouldn't work for this reason, but then if I do that, it's, 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 by talking about it, we will stimulate new ideas. And this is our, I guess, our opportunity to lead that change. Those global factors are going to be happening all around us that we can't influence. By getting ahead of the game, it's our opportunity to, to um, not be playing catch up, essentially, and having things being forced, forced on us. And so just finally, I guess, um, uh, well, every project that I work on, essentially, I think this is really important. Um, but given what I've just mentioned in terms of stimulating conversations and, and challenging people's thinking, um, farmer input is, is really critical, which I think is a great segue to open the floor to questions. Cool. So we've just got one mic running um, because this is the sound recording for the questions, uh, for the video. So, um, yeah, please feel free to ask your questions. Um, with carving once every two years, how much were you able to reduce the time of the mammoth being out of milk? Like, what would that look like? Um, I, I guess that's why we want to run the farm and experiment to test that out, because we don't, we simply don't know how far those cows will, will go. Um, it, potentially, you could be increasing the days of milk quite a lot, right? Because you, you're only got one dry period instead of two dry periods in that, that two years. Yep, yeah, that's right. So the, these are all things that we, with a project like this, we're trying to shortcut like a decade of research essentially. You could do all the component kind of things to work out those questions. We want to sort of jump to the end and go, right, this is our best bet, but we will learn in doing so where some of the, the answers to these questions are. So simple question is I don't really know yet. <laughs> Yeah, Paul, you might have already answered, partially answered the question I was going to going to yeah. ask. Yeah, what assumptions went into that plus nine minus four percent profit, and what assumptions were different between, say, regions? Because I think you made some reference to regions <coughs> in that as well. So, yeah, I, I don't know if you've got any sort of points you can share around the um, assumptions. Not really, because the person that actually did the modelling is not here. Um, but certainly, we looked at under four pasture growth curves. So, in Northland a Waikato, a Canterbury and a Southland, and so obviously, you know, th those up in North Island ones have a much more winter pasture growth, which is a, a key difference about that system, I guess, is that you're milking through the winter. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of the other assumptions, I think, well, there's a Grasslands paper that we're writing that we, we can share all that kind of information in the next um, six months, but I guess I don't want to um, get too hung up on that. Like, that's kind of a an exercise to say, to check that we weren't doing something totally crazy, but there's so many assumptions, you, you could drive a bus through some of those assumptions, right? Because there's not actually any data to, to kind of inform those things, so. Um. 
Oh, yeah, hey, Paul. Um, I'm really excited about this because I've been talking about this exact idea with farmers for about three years now. I see it as one of the main ways that we can potentially reduce the bobby calf load. I think that might be the key outcome from it because we're halving the number of calves yep. on ground. And so my question comes off that. Are you in your farmlet studies going to look at like maybe using sex semen and beef calves and reducing bobby calves altogether? I mean, that's detail that we haven't worked out yet. Um, so we're just setting that those kind of decisions up at the moment. <coughs> um, potentially, though, like that, that's certainly, as you say, it's one of the a big advantages of the system, and so it would seem silly not to play around with some of those. Those are kind of like when I talk about system components. Like these are the big ticket kind of items that dictate the direction. Then there's a whole lot of the components that come and sit in behind that. But. Sorry. And that's, you know, thinking about all of the potential um, unders and overs that could be going on in the system. Where yes, those cows are going to produce less in the second year, no question, right? But another uh, potential advantage, as you say, better reproductive performance, mm. lower replacement rate, mm. older herd, that those older cows produce more. Like, there's, there's so many things that we don't know until we do it, kind of how that's going to, it's going to play out. Cool. So. Yeah. We've just got a few minutes left, guys. Um, so me and my husband are actually quite similar. We've already started kind of playing around with trying to stretch out our cows um, calving because I come from a, an English um, dairy farming background and I've always been a big believer that the reason we have, it, specifically with our herd because we use a lot of overseas genetics with our fertility is because we're trying to get them in calf in a really intense way that they're not really designed for but my husband's biggest concern has been around as you were saying with the 24 month season if something goes wrong and we have to dry off early um, and my argument with that has always been the all year round carving because if something does go wrong hopefully only a small percentage of the herd will be affected as opposed to 50 percent of the herd or the whole herd so if you have a season that is incredibly dry hopefully only part of the herd's peak is affected and then the rest of the herd are able to peak when the season's kind of stabilized a bit <clears throat> and i think the last two seasons have been so up in the air and so all over the place with their weather that i worry that if we keep planning around our seasons doing what they've always done we're not gonna get anywhere because they're just not doing what they've always done yep um so i, I guess like i sort of talked about before that feed supply profile is the kind of dictate i mean that's why we do 12 months spring carving the, the seasons have changed so in the region like the waikato there's more and more doing autumn carving now and things like that so I guess farmers do respond to that. Um, I guess the flat calving one, you end up with surpluses that you're going to need to harvest and deficits that you're going to need to fill versus at least sticking with some element of the seasonal calving, helping better align with that. Um, and, and yes, you're right that, OK, there's 50% of the herd that could be at risk, but I guess I would look at that as quite a good thing that, OK, if you get a real stink of a drought, you could be drying 50% off it to protect those the rest of those cows that are gonna gonna milk right through so it it is a risk mitigator over certainly running like a 24 month where they're all carving in one year and sorry last question for gang we're just about out of time i'll keep it short um the extended lactation trials that i think it was eric culver did back in the early 2000s um they primarily highlighted just how fat the cows got once they got into that second year of lactation. So have you modelled how you would essentially reduce that or is it you can't really look at that till you scale it up? Um, and then my second question was around the staff and the labour side of things. I can't quite remember that, that graph that you had up initially, but ultimately staff or whoever is on the farm is going to be milking through every winter. There's actually no downtime at all and my understanding of staff and labour on farm and the feedback over the years is they actually enjoy having that downturn downtime period yep look i think we don't know life is full of trade-offs um and so the the winter milking aspect to it okay the good news is it's only half the herd you're milking through the winter rather than the whole herd 
Um, but yes, that's probably a, a negative thing that uh, for some people will not be attractive. I guess for what we're looking at is saying is that going to be better than the peak in workload and the fatigue and, and stress and burnout and ultimately not being attractive to attract new people to the industry. Um, so that might be the, the thing that we give up. That, that holiday, which depending on the size of your farm, by flattening out those peaks makes it so much easier to plan that you can give that person that annual leave at that, at that time. So you're not sort of confined by how busy you are at certain times. Um, the other question, well, oh, the Eric Cole study. So there has been about three or four, and clearly you might jump in and, and four, yeah, three previous extended lactation studies. They've all been component studies. So we've never done a, a sort of systems look. Um, there's, our models are not, uh, don't predict, that our sort of empirical models, animal models to predict performance don't cope that well with extended lactation scenarios, which does make it quite difficult to predict. Um, but it's, the decision rules we use around feeding is gonna be really important to, this, to the success of, or not, of this experiment and, and said unf we're trying to shortcut a decade of research out of this basically by just giving it a go and kind of learning on the on the on the on the fly effectively versus you could run a whole lot of component studies to try and try and work that out um, trade-offs again right speed versus uh, and then again if, if the system let's say the result comes out there hey it is a bit less profitable right but if it's not terrible then it says probably we can optimise the system by running all these other bits of research to, to make it work, but at least you know you've got the big picture right to then justify going and doing that versus spending a decade testing and refining something that actually overall is not going to work. That, that's my view anyway. Okay, thank you very much, Paul Edwards. Uh, we appreciate that.